Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, April 18th, 1809, I think it was actually April 19th, 1809, Thomas Jefferson signs over John Freeman to new president James Madison. And I will just note the obvious right here. John Freeman was anything but. John Freeman was for many years an enslaved person. And then he was working inside the White House as an indentured servant. We will kind of get into um, how those lines blur together in interesting ways. But this is the moment when Jefferson is leaving the White House as president and And he drafts a document that signs Freeman over to the incoming president, Madison, which means that Freeman will remain inside the White House. So this is a chance to talk about the life of John Freeman, but also how enslaved people help build and run the White House and lots more here, as always, to discuss are Nicole Hemmer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello. Hey there. Hello, Jody. Um, So Kelly... As I said, Jefferson leaving the White House, he's going to go back to Monticello, which is his estate in uh, central Virginia. Uh, Why does Freeman not go back with him? So I think before we even get into this, I just want to paint a larger context. So there are a lot of uh, Mm -hmm. the first four out of five American presidents are slaveholders. The first four out of five American presidents are also from Virginia. And there was this common practice of, you know, doing the work or their business within Washington, D.C., and then spending time in their home of Virginia or Monticello, where um, Thomas Jefferson goes. So John Freeman is actually owned or enslaved by um, Dr. William Baker. And then when he's about 20 years old, President Jefferson hires him to work in the White House as a waiter in the White House. Um, And he becomes one of the most capable and entrusted um, servants in the White House, you know, taking care of all of the ins and outs of the home. And so when Thomas Jefferson uh, heads to Monticello, Um, John Freeman is interested in staying because he has developed a relationship with a woman that he would like to marry. And he knows that if he goes back to Virginia, he can't uh, maintain the relationship that he has um, with the woman he's in love with. Hmm. He meets Melinda, who is a woman who's enslaved by Thomas Jefferson's daughter. And they want to get married. Um, He asks Jefferson's permission. They end up getting married. He asks Jefferson to buy Melinda so that they can be together. And Jefferson refuses. But um, in between the time that they marry and when Jefferson leaves the White House, Melinda is freed. There's a provision in Virginia law that if you are a free black person, you have to leave the state or risk being re-enslaved. So Mm -hmm. she can't go back to Virginia. So when Thomas Jefferson is getting ready at the end of his his presidency to go back to Monticello and he wants to take John Freeman with him, John Freeman is like, wait, my wife can't come with Mm -hmm. me. I, I would have to leave my wife and my children if you take me back to Monticello. And he manages to convince Jefferson to sell the rest of his contract. And we'll talk about that contract, but to sell the rest of his contract to Madison. But I mean, there's this real sort of Shakespearean star-crossed lovers kind of thing at the heart of all this, right? Where we can, I I can only stay um, in D.C. if I want to be with the woman I want to be with, and I have to then, you know, appeal to my owner in order to to do that. And so I want to talk about that moment, because what happens is Freeman, as I gather, you know, writes a letter to Jefferson and basically says, 
please transfer my, at this point, he's not enslaved, it's an indentured servitude, but he, you know, he says, please transfer my contract to Madison. What do we make of that kind of like direct personal appeal? Mm. I mean, I think that oftentimes we, we don't understand how difficult it was to maintain relationships while in slavery, to maintain kinship between a spouse or a child um, or your entire family for that matter. And so enslaved people have to do a lot of bargaining and pleading to really get their slaveholders to see their humanity, to see um, their desire to be with their loved ones. Um, and there's a lot of maneuvering and, and negotiating and bargaining that has to take place in order to get these contracts to happen. And oftentimes they don't, you know, enslavers are not sympathetic. And so it, for them, it's all about the bottom, the economic bottom line. Right. Um, and so for, you know, Thomas Jefferson, it's, you know, does this is this in my economic interest or not? And it's such a, a challenging story in some ways because John Freeman is using every last bit of agency he has in order to build and protect his family. And at the same time, many enslaved people are trying to do the same thing and they just they're, they don't have the ability to do it. Um, and so th- there's something remarkable about this story because he is able to make a case and make a case as in a very his his language is very servile making it feel to Jefferson like he has the options and he has the control mm-hmm. which of course he does um but he's very savvy about the way he appeals to Jefferson again and again in order to work things out so that he and his family get to be free mm-hmm. and together mm-hmm. and Jefferson also has hundreds of slaves he has over yeah. 600 people enslaved so the idea that this you know, conversation is is taking place. I just wanted to be clear in our listeners' minds that it's not um, as though Thomas Jefferson has five or six slaves in close relationships with yeah. all of them. Um, you know, there are hundreds of people who are um, beholden to him and are also trying to negotiate in their own ways uh, their their freedom. Does it matter though that that Freeman is in the domestic sphere? It does in the sense that he has proximity to power. So, you know, if you're an enslaved person in the field, you can be a little bit more anonymous. You have a little bit more autonomy, you know. Uh, But when you're in the house, you are a reflection of your masters. You know everything that's going on and throughout the home. You know about their business. um, You know about their personal business, their political business and their personal business. But you're also, you know, most susceptible to, to violence as well. Um, and violent outbursts. I think oftentimes there's this myth or this idea that if you're a domestic slave or that if you're in the home, you somehow have a better or elevated experience. Um, but a lot of times you're in closer proximity to violence. Yeah. And I think that's important to note too. Yeah. And I think it also matters the decision John Freeman's former enslaver, Dr. Baker, made because Jefferson has. A, a term limit on how long he is going to be able to hold this person in servitude. Um, and I, I think that this gets at the the really unusual nature of the position that John Freeman was in. Um, increasingly, America is moving away from a variety of different kinds of unfreedom and towards just mm-hmm. chattel, hereditary slavery. Mm-hmm. And John Freeman exists in this moment when his former enslaver, sells him to Thomas Jefferson, but sells him to Jefferson with a contract of 15 years of servitude, at the end of which John Freeman will be a a free man. And that's a very different situation for most of the people that Jefferson Mm -hmm. enslaved. So, you know, that lets us advance the story a little bit. Here in 1809, we have the transfer of the contract to Madison. We don't know exactly how much that's for, but, you know, as as we're saying, I think it would be calculated to the remainder of his original contract in his time in service. Freeman stays in the White House as a servant, uh, playing much the same role, you know, as a butler um, inside the White House. He does pop up, actually, if you read papers about the War of 1812, when they had to scramble and, like, clear everything out of the White House. Uh, Freeman, you know, had a big role in that. Um, But then it's in 1815 that he gets his manumission. But then, interestingly, he stays for another year in Mm -hmm. the White House. Um, But this time as a, I'm sure, very poorly compensated, but nevertheless free uh, employee. 
it just reminds me, I mean, so much of the story is not the same, but it reminds me of Eugene Allen, who, um, if you remember the film, The Butler, he like works in the White House for 34 mm-hmm. years, but just in the ways that black labor gets so tethered to the federal government uh, for a number of reasons, both good and bad. But it does make me think about, you know, the ways that he had to navigate uh, his ability to be able to provide for himself and his family and the way that the federal government did that for him. Yeah, I think that's important. And especially in this period when it's a a mix Mm -hmm. of free and enslaved black people who are working in the White House alongside white people as well. I mean, in the White House, both building it and staffing it, there were more than 300 enslaved people as part of that history. And that's a history that we don't often tell when we tell the history of the White House. And John Freeman is such an interesting character in that story, precisely because he's moving in these various sort of um, spaces of free and unfree labor. And you say build, I mean, literally build. Literally There's wings of the White House that were built. I mean, that's um, one of the, you know, taglines of Michelle Obama. Like, I lived in a house built by slaves. The Capitol included. A lot of these federal buildings, they used enslaved labor in order to uh, create these uh, buildings. Same thing is true for the university that Jefferson Mm -hmm. builds. There's a a project underway now to recover the names of all the enslaved people who both built the University of Virginia and would Mm -hmm. serve students at the University of Virginia um, for many of its its Mm -hmm. earliest decades. Um, so let's start to wrap up here and just you know talk about the later chapters of John and and Melinda Freeman's lives. I mean, they stay. I think is this right? They stayed together, right? They I do. Think. They stay together. They they work to save up their funds to purchase additional members of their family. You know, Melinda becomes yeah. a, a seamstress. Um, in eighteen oh nine, she's paid thirty one dollars and fifty cents uh, for her for her needlework, uh, which becomes pretty famous. So you know, they're doing everything that they can. Um, um, to ensure that they can have a quality of life for themselves, but also purchase as many family members as as they can. Um, and they are able to do that. You know, in the 1820s, he purchased his, his sister-in-law, Mary Colbert, also from Thomas Jefferson's estate for fifty dollars. Um, I mean, this is this is no small feat to be able to raise this amount of money and and purchase someone. Um, and it's clear where their intentions are. Their moment that they get freed, they're trying to free someone else. And we should say that not only are they buying members of their family, but John Freeman is going to help work within an organization that raises money to buy people who are uh, at risk of being separated from their families. So they're doing this really important activism Mm -hmm. in order to manumit as many people as possible, particularly people who are in the most dangerous spots. And I think it's it's a important that some of those are are people who are at risk of seeing their families Mm -hmm. torn apart. That was one of the big dangers and evils of the many evils of of slavery, but one that clearly was so close to John and Melinda's hearts that they make that part of their activism after they're free. Especially in a place like Washington, D.C. You know, Washington, D.C. is a very large slave trading hub. And, you know, during what is called the second great forced migration, one out of three enslaved families are separated by the auction block. Um, Everyone had about a 30 percent chance of being, you know, taken away from their loved one. And so um, everyone is hyper aware of that, especially in this moment that these relationships were so precarious. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's leave it there with our story of John and Melinda Freeman. Um, before we go, we should rattle off a few of these. Also on this days, you can chime in if you have thoughts. But if this is one of those random days, April 18th, that seems chocker block full of other interesting things that happened throughout history. So uh, what? 1775, Paul Revere and William Dawes warn of a British attack. William Dawes doesn't get mentioned enough. Right. So you always hear about Paul Revere. So we want to give William Dawes a shout out. Uh, The Three-Fifths Compromise was on this date, 1783. Have you noticed that there's this weird, like, relitigating of the Three-Fifths Compromise going on right now that's really awful? I think it's mostly on... Yes. Bad quarters of the internet, but yeah, we gotta mm. we gotta do a segment, but mm-hmm. really dumb. <laughs> uh, the Doolittle Raid in 1942, which is when the U.S. bombs uh, Tokyo. So. Really important moment psychologically in World War II because the U.S. had been so stunned by the attack on Pearl Harbor that showing off their ability to attack Japan's mainland was sort of like, all right, we didn't actually achieve much with that bombing, but we did have this psychological breakthrough that we could do it. Yeah. Um, and that was a really important moment. Uh, 1906 is the San Francisco earthquake is on this day. And then 2019, 
the redacted version of the Mueller report is released. Mm. Did that feel like just two years ago? <laughs> if by two years you mean two decades, then yes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Sorry, <okay>. God. <laughs> yeah, the San Francisco earthquake feels more recent than the Mueller report. <laughs> That's so true, though. <laughs> um, okay, well, that brings us to the end of the episode. Uh, Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you as always. My pleasure. And Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thanks, Jody. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, listener-supported, artist-owned podcasts. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Thanks again to everyone who has reached out with comments and questions and potential topics. You can email us, thisdaypod at gmail.com. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon.